You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 9, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Demystifying the FDA, Regulation of Drugs and Biologics. Our presenter is Dr. Kelly Stone. He's the Associate Director for Therapeutic Review in the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Good morning, everyone. This is the second hour of COLA uh, for April 9th, 2021. Um, it is a great pleasure to have with us for the second hour, um, Dr. Kelly Stone. Um, Dr. Stone recently became the Associate Director for Therapeutic Review, the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care at the Office of Immunology and Inflammation, Office of New Drugs, Center for Drug Evaluation Research, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> I hope you don't have to have that on your, your business card. It's kind of take up the whole card. Um, um, I've known Dr. Stone for a long time. We've been on a number of committees together, and we're presently on the um, ACGME RRC together. So um, uh, Dr. Stone recently moved to the FDA, um, and he suggested um, this talk for COLA. It seemed like a good idea. We had kind of talked about some of this stuff. Um, a while back uh, when he was a lot busier um, and uh, this he had a, an opportunity to do this and um, he's also going to be speaking with us I think I conned you into doing next month uh, as well um, I had to grab him when I could get him <laughs> um, to to talk about um, um, just doing um, clinical research so for this morning he's going to um, help us demystify the FDA um, the regulation of drugs and biologics. So I'll let Kelly take it away. Well, thank you, Paul. And I, I, I have to make one correction, which is I'm no less busy now than I've ever been. <laughs> um, but, but, but this was a lot of fun to put together. Um, and you are correct. Uh, there are a lot of acronyms used within government. So um, uh, my whole title is much, much shorter with acronyms. But um, since most people don't know what the acronyms are, they're spelled out. Um, so um, I'm going to go through um, uh, uh, this morning um, uh, some things that I, I actually wish I had known when I was a fellow and things that I didn't really know early in my career. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about um, uh, today about the FDA in general and investigational new drug applications and new drug applications and um, safety issues. Um, to, to try to give a little bit of insight into how uh, drug regulation is done. Um, next month, uh, in the middle of May, um, I'm going to give another talk, which is going to be more uh, about design of clinical trials, uh, various aspects of, of, of clinical research. So um, they're really meant to be companion talks. So um, a disclaimer, um, what I'm going to talk about are my personal views. They're not the views of uh, of the FDA. Uh, everything I'm presenting is in the public domain. Um, and I, uh, I've been in the, with the federal government, so I was at the NIH um, for 12 years before I moved to the FDA two years ago. So uh, after 14 years in, in the federal government, I have absolutely no conflicts. Um, and the learning objectives are uh, to understand the role of the FDA in regulating drugs and biologics. Um, and then understanding requirements for INDs and new drug applications. Um, I do want to touch on um, labeling. Um, so labeling is something that I really did not have a full appreciation of before, and I'll, I'll go through that. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about FDA um, activities around COVID-19, which uh, really has dominated um, our, our, our work over the past um here and will continue to dominate our work, I, I anticipate, for, for some time to come. Um, so I, I don't think I can really talk about um, uh, the FDA without going through the, the, the history. And um, the FDA um, has developed in advance, really, um, unfortunately, ar around tragedies. Um, so there really were no um, laws around um, uh, around drug safety. Um, in, in the 1800s, um, there was the Drug Importation Act, which required that any drugs coming from outside the U.S. be inspected. 
Um, but the first real laws around drug regulation came at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so there, there was a, um, a tragic event with a um, diphtheria outbreak. Uh, there were patients who were treated with a diphtheria antitoxin from a horse that um, was infected with tetanus. And as a result, seven children died. And this spurred Congress to pass the Biologics Control Act, uh, which has also been called the Virus Serum Antitoxin Act. Um, and then around the same time, um, Harvey Wiley um, is, is really one of the pivotal figures in the founding of the FDA. Um, he's shown over here, and uh, Harvey Wiley was a chemist um, that uh, was involved in industry, but um, he had uh, great concerns about um, what was being done with food products in particular, uh, with addition of chemicals, um, labeling things such as um, mixtures of glucose and hayseed and red food coloring is strawberry jam um, and things that he found rather rather problematic. As a result, he, he formed the division of chemistry in the Department of Agriculture in the late 1800s. Um, and one of the things he did um, on the picture here on the right, I don't know if you can see the arrow that I'm pointing, but um, he formed something called the Poison Squad, and if you haven't heard about it, um, the Poison Squad was 12 volunteers um, who volunteered to have regular dinners, um, but the dinners were all uh, laced with uh, various chemicals that uh, uh, Dr. Wiley was interested in seeing what the effects were, uh, things like formaldehyde and boric acid that were be being added to foods, uh, and he really was a proponent. Um, for uh, greater regulation of, of the food industry. And around the same time, uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle uh, came out um, uh, demonstrating the problems in the meatpacking industry, and it really caused a public uh, um, uproar that led to the signing by um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt of the Food and Drug Act in 1906. So that was sort of the beginning of, of the FDA. Um, there, there, there wasn't a whole lot of power they had. They had inspectors. Uh, a very small group that did a, a very good job uh, with very few resources. And then over the next uh, 30 years or so, there continued to be problems, um, uh, particularly with drugs. Uh, and there was another tragic incident um, where sulfonilamide had been uh, developed as an antibiotic. And a manufacturer uh, wanted to make it palatable in a liquid form, uh, particularly for children. and um, uh, compounded it with ethylene glycol to give it a sweet flavor, um, and uh, 107 people died uh, from that product, mostly children. And even though there had been a push for a greater uh, safety of drugs and food, um, this event really is what Congress uh, uh, triggered Congress to sign the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetics Act in, in 1938. And this was the beginning of, of safety assessment of drugs. So um, the, the act required that any new product going uh, on the market had to have demonstrated safety. Um, and it had to be reviewed before anything went on the market. It also gave the FDA uh, the right to authorize, um, I, I'm sorry, to authorize the FDA to inspect factories. Um, and it extended uh, the um, review to cosmetics and devices. So. Uh, there's a famous story of a mascara um, that um, uh, women who use this particular mascara uh, uh, develop blindness, um, and there are a lot of abuses of products. So um, the FTC and the FD and C Act uh, signed in 1938 uh, was pivotal in in the development of safe products. Um, there was a push uh, in addition to safety uh, products should demonstrate the effect that they're purported to have. And there was great resistance in Congress, but um, the thalidomide um, uh, review um, uh, that occurred in the early 1960s by uh, Francis Kelsey, who is a, um, a heroic figure uh, both in the country and certainly um, within the FDA, um, reviewed this product. She was a new reviewer at the FDA. Uh, it's a product that had been reviewed, uh, had been approved in in Europe and in Canada and other um, countries for. Um, pregnancy-associated nausea, and it was given to her as a simple review of a product that had already been characterized, and um, she identified problems and deficiencies and uh, would not approve it. 
Um, and that near miss um, in the U.S. led to the signing of the Kefauver Harris Amendment um, to the FDNC Act. And what this did for the first time, it required that any product uh, to be marketed had to be demonstrated to be both safe and effective. And there's language in there that you're going to see a little bit later in the talk that refers to adequate and well-controlled studies. So uh, for a product to be approved, um, there, there had to be substantial evidence of effectiveness based on adequate and well-controlled studies, which really implies two random, at least uh, uh, two randomized controlled trials that demonstrate both safety and efficacy. Um, and then the modern um, uh, AX uh, to the FDA uh, that have influenced where we are now. In 1992, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act um, allowed the FDA to collect fees from applicants to speed reviews and approvals. So um, um, due to staffing, the, um, at the bottom here, you can see all of the, the stack of um, binders. Uh, this is one application for a new drug. Um, there are stories of trucks rolling in with boxes of, of, of um, paper to be reviewed uh, for new products. And um, because of delays in approval, um, uh, Congress passed this act uh, called uh, PDUFA. Um, and uh, as a result, any company that has a product that they want reviewed for marketing has to pay a fee, and that helps to support the um, activities of the FDA. Uh, this has been uh, renewed every five years since 1992. It'll be renewed again um, next year. Um, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovations Act provides a pathway for um, biosimilars, so generic equivalent of biologics. Uh, and then in 2012, uh, uh, FDASIA, or the Food, uh, Drug Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, allowed for user fees for generic drugs and biosimilars and uh, ways to um, get uh, quicker approval for breakthrough therapies. Um, so that's how we got to where we are. So the, the, the current mission of the FDA is to protect the public health um, through ensuring the safe, uh, safety, efficacy, and security of human veterinary drugs, biological products, and medical devices. And this includes um, safety of investigational products that are being studied, um, safety of products that are going to be marketed, so approval of products. Um, it has to do with monitoring manufacturing and quality of products, quality of devices, um, things like inhales and nebulizer are very carefully regulated, and um, after they're marketed, post-marketing safety. Um, the FDA ensures the safety of our nation's food supply, cosmetics um, products that emit radiation, tobacco products, um, speeding innovations that make medical products more effective, safer, more affordable, um, helping get accurate information out to the public. And then the final bullet point, um, so I joined um, the FDA in June of 2019 and um, had a little time to settle in, but uh, one of the major efforts of the FDA is to foster the development of medical products to respond to either deliberate or naturally emerging uh, public health threats such as pandemics. Um, and at the end of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about how we've been um, re reviewing uh, COVID products. Uh, the review work, um, again, um, I, I, before I was at the NIH and certainly before I was at the FDA, I had absolutely no concept um, of what the FDA looked like and, and folks there. Um, the FDA, in the past 10, 15 years, moved to a campus um, in Silver Spring, Maryland called the White Oak Campus. It's built around this building, which was uh, the original Naval Ordnance Laboratory. Uh, it's now the main building, building um, at the FDA campus. Um, but around it are all of these uh, modern LEED certified buildings. Um, and it's really a, a, a beautiful campus. It's very um, uh, tightly uh, protected. Um, this is a very, if you if you saw an organization chart of, of, of the FDA, it's just insane in all the directions. But what I've done is I've highlighted some things that I think are, are, are useful to know. So uh, we have a commissioner. Uh, the commissioner is appointed by the president, or I should say nominated by the president and, and confirmed by the Senate. Um, the acting commissioner now is Janet Woodcock, who's been with the FDA for uh, several decades. She had been the director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. 
She moved to Operation Warp Speed last year and then was appointed as, as uh, acting commissioner of the FDA. Um, and there are four centers that are uh, probably worth your knowing. Um, so the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, where I am, um, oversees prescription drugs, including biological therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies, generic drugs, and over-the-counter drugs. The Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER, you've heard about in the context of the COVID vaccines. They regulate vaccines, allergenic products, um, Belforzia, um, uh, in any of the um, approved allergenic products for skin testing, uh, blood products, including immunoglobulin replacement, C1 esterase inhibitor, and then products for gene and cell therapy. Center for Devices oversees diagnostic testing that are laboratory-based or um, uh, device-based testing, ventilators, nebulizer, injection devices. Um, and then the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, or CIFSAN, uh, oversees uh, food safety, including labeling of foods and uh, labeling of, of the allergen. So um, all, all four of these centers have, have direct impact on, on things that you do from day to day. Um, within CEDAR, um, just as a demonstration, so um, the Office of New Drugs um, oversees um, approval and review of any new drug products that come in. And this is split across divisions, and there are, um, I, I'm, I'm shocked by how many allergists and immunologists there are within the FDA, spread amongst divisions, centers, um, including the Office of Generic Drugs. Um, so Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, Critical Care, where I am, we oversee products uh, for asthma, COPD, retro angioedema, urticaria, food allergy, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal pulp, things like that. Uh, atopic dermatitis, contact dermatitis, uh, germ and dental, um, EOE and EGID, there's a gastroenterology division, and um, on there's a rare disease and genetics group. Um, there's a biosimilars group. Um, and then there's the Office of Generic Drugs, and 90% um, of all prescriptions in the U.S. are generic drugs. Um, so they oversee any generic drugs, including generic albuterol um, and um, uh, other uh, generic products that come in. Um, in in CBER, the Center for Biologics Evalu Evaluation Research, they oversee vaccines, allergenic products, fecal transplant products, probiotics, and then in the tissue and advanced therapy side, gene therapy, cell therapy, human tissue products, uh, like thymic tissue for transplants are regulated over here, um, immunoglobulin replacement, um, et cetera. So that's sort of um, uh, a rough overview of, of, of the structure um, or the organization of the FDA. Um, review of products that come in um, are, are done by multidisciplinary review teams. And I have to say, as a new member of the FDA team, I'm incredibly impressed by um, the depth of knowledge across multiple disciplines um, uh, that go into every product um, uh, that's reviewed uh, by the agency. So there are clinical reviewers. Um, there are non-clinical reviewers who are PhD. Um, who uh, evaluate um, animal model data, for example, clinical pharmacologists, statistical reviewers, um, product quality. So um, the, uh, uh, the uh, quality of the products is very carefully um, uh, reviewed. Microbiology reviewers to make sure that uh, sterile products are sterile, uh, device reviewers, regulatory program managers, many others. And, this is my group, uh, which at the time in 2019 was called the Division of Pulmon Pulmonary Allergy Rheumatology. We've now split and we're the Division of Pulmonology, Allergy, and Critical Care. Um, but, um, you know, I, I point out there are faces. Um, there are some fellows who I trained um, um, in this group. Uh, there are people who are straight out of training. There are people mid-career. And people who have spent um, long careers at the FDA. Um, and then a, a final, um, just to uh, point out, medical officers um, uh, uh, at the FDA really are at the center of, 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 of review of new products. Um, I'm going to go through the life cycle of, of, of drug development, but medical officers are involved um, at the point that um, first-in-human studies are, are performed. 
uh, medical officers are involved in um, working with the non-clinical team, making sure that there's sufficient safety data to justify going into humans and sufficient data to um, help guide a safe dose for initial studies. And then throughout the life cycle, beyond that point, through phase one, two, and three studies, and after marketing, uh, medical officers are involved um, in, in review throughout. Um, as I said, our medical officers are recent graduates. Some are, are mid-career. Um, uh, all, all medical officers work with the team leader, and there's a very defined structure um, involved in investigational new drug application review, new drug applications, biologic licensing application, so monoclonal antibodies, anything defined as a biologic. Post-marketing safety, we consult within the FDA broadly for other centers that may have things where they need an allergist immunologist to help provide um, input. Um, of note, most of our medical officers continue with um, clinical involvement uh, one day a week of, um, of a clinic uh, is professional development. And then uh, many of us, um, uh, pre-COVID, certainly during COVID, all of us are teleworking, but even pre-COVID, um, uh, due to the nature of the work, there's a, a, a lot of telework um, that's done. Um, and these folks um, have uh, a very uh, well-honed critical thinking skills, strong clinical knowledge base, um, um, science clinical research backgrounds. Um, they're very good at technical writing and very detail-oriented. Um, and since no one, myself included, um, I've never gone through my career saying, I can't wait until I get to the FDA um, and spent my life training um, um, for that. Um, the agency is very good at um, training programs. So there's a two-year training program for medical officers. Um, it's essentially a master's level program in regulatory science, drug law, uh, very extensive training in clinical trial design and biostatistics epidemiology of safety, basics of toxicology, chemistry, manufacturing, quality control of drug products, communication skills, and then teamwork uh, skills, which is absolutely critical. I've never been in another environment where um, teamwork um, uh, works as well as it does. And it really is through uh, careful attention to building teams and making sure teams are, are working well. All right. So, that's the history and um, sort of um, uh, the structure and organization of the current FDA. So um, the oversight authority that we have for drugs and biologics um, comes at multiple levels. So um, comes from the Constitution. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, I've heard talks about all of these things, and I'm not going to uh, answer questions. But there are things like the Commerce Clause. So interstate commerce is um, uh, the basis for um, investigational new drug applications and new drug applications, um, due process clause, takings clause, first amendment. So it constitute um, the foundation of what the FDA does and regulatory oversight comes from the Constitution. Then there are laws which are acts of Congress that outline binding conduct or practice in the community. And these are things like the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the Public Health Service Act, which uh, helps to regulate uh, biologics. Um, the next level are regulations. Uh, regulations um, help to explain the law in greater granularity. So um, the regulations that are re relevant um, um, to you if you're doing clinical investigations is in Section 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 21 CFR. Uh, why? Because this is where all the language is about protect protections of human subjects. Um, it gives great detail about the requirements for an IND submission, including what should be included in it, um, NDA submissions, what should be included. Um, and then the final level are guidances, and um, guidances are really valuable to know about. So guidances are documents that the FDA generates. Um, it's usually FDA staff that generates these. And it describes our interpretation of policy or regulation. It may uh, give um, our view for specific uh, development of products for specific indications, uh, what sorts of things we look uh, for. And what's key is this provides the agency's thinking on an issue, but it's not legally binding. So it's our interpretation of regulation. It's our trying to provide guidance to industry and to investigators um, um, to help um, 
uh, with transparency. Um, so guidances are available on the internet so around COVID. We've developed one around the requirements for um, developing products around COVID. Um, so these other things, the regulations in that, I wouldn't read them. Um, but guidance is there, there are going to be points in your life where it actually you may find valuable information in these documents. So the drug life cycle, um, I'm not going to go through the early end, but there's research and discovery, uh, which is what the NIH-funded research um, in the industry is very good at, identifying targets um, uh, through uh, many, many methods. Um, but once a potential drug is developed, it goes into preclinical development, um, which includes everything from characterizing mechanism of action um, to in vitro tests, effects of the drug on different immunoassays, for example. Most important, are, though, are toxicology studies and animal models. So any drug that's going to be studied has to have been studied in animal models. Um, generally, two, including a rodent and then a higher, um, a higher level animal. Um, and these are done to demonstrate um, toxicity and also um, to look at dosing to help uh, uh, determine um, a, a safe uh, dosing margin. So when you go into um, humans, you, um, um, you're, you're doing it as safely as possible. Um, and then there are other studies um, for longer term uh, treatments, genotoxicity, reproductive toxicity studies are done in animal models. If you're going to um, uh, do pediatric studies, they have to have juvenile animal studies, again, to help predict um, um, toxicities that may be seen in humans that may um, convince us that it's not safe to study in humans, or um, it may help guide us what to look for in safety reports um, and risk mitigation as this goes into, into humans. Um, and then phase one trials are the first in human studies. Um, these are done if a drug product has never been studied in humans. If it's an approved product, but they're looking at a, a new route of administration, it has to go through phase one studies. Um, and these studies are really designed to look at safety, tolerability, and pharm pharmacokinetics. Um, they can also look um, at drug-drug interactions and food effects. So um, foods may be absorbed differently if you're in the fasting versus fed state. And sometimes they're substantially different. Um, so um, uh, companies are required to do all of these studies so that we really understand how the drug is behaving um, in patients. Um, there are dose ranging studies. So we want to find do um, safe doses as we go um, to um, later uh, phase development. So most phase one studies are done in healthy volunteers. Um, they usually start out as single ascending doses with the placebo where you give let's say eight patients, six drug, two placebo, and you give them a low dose of the drug and you see what happens. And then you go to a higher dose, see what happens in a higher dose. And you go through uh, multiple doses um, to demonstrate um, safety and tolerability. Um, once you've done that, you move on to multiple ascending doses where you select one of those doses. And rather than giving a single dose, you give multiple doses that's going to be similar to what you expect to do in your phase two program. So you may give the drug twice a day for seven days and see what happens and then go to a higher dose and a higher dose. So that's multiple ascending dose study. Um, in phase one, um, there are products where you want to do central dosing. So um, I don't know if uh, uh, you guys have spoken about the TGN 1412 story. Um, I'll, I'll briefly comment, um, this was a CD28 super agonist that was developed. Um, it was it went through animal models, including um, uh, primate models, and uh, it went into trial in the UK uh, at a research center. Um, they gave the drug to six patients simultaneously, um, and um, like clockwork, all six of them went into multi-organ failure. Um, some lost digits, they, um, they all survived. Um, but, but, but it's an example of where animal models have limitations, which I'm not going to discuss what the limitations were there. But if it's a truly new product, we really encourage sentinel dosing where you give it to um, the drug to a patient, placebo to a patient, see what happens before you go into, in, into more patients.
And then phase one trials are usually small, maybe up to 80 participants. Um, and for some toxic drugs, for onco oncologic indications, for example, you may start in, in patients. So um, they may not be, you can't justify the safety in a healthy volunteer, so you go into patients. And these are called phase 1B studies. Um, and, and then just one reminder down here, because I, I um, you guys are more recently out of medical school than I, I, I am, and having moved from the NIH, um, uh, just a refresher, pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug, so ADME, so um, absorption of drug, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and then pharmacodynamics are what the drug does to the body. So, you know, from a mechanistic reduction of free IgE levels, for example, with things like Zolaire, or reducing blood eosinophils, or decreasing FENO, or maybe effects on blood pressure. But pharmacokinetics is what your body does to the drug, and pharmacodynamics is what the drug does uh, to the body. All right, so that's phase one. And to demonstrate safety, um, tolerability, you've done some dose um, ranging. Um, phase two trials are primarily efficacy for the uh, population of interest. Um, and um, these are proof of concept trials where you develop this product, you think it's going to be helpful in a particular disease, um, and now you're going to test it. Um, and you're going to do um, randomized controlled trials where you have a placebo comparator, ideally. Sometimes you may have an active comparator where it's a head-to-head. -head. Um, other um, comparators that can be used that are less than ideal are contemporaneous comparators or histor historical comparators. Um, you're looking at safety but um, in these studies, but it's usually shorter duration studies, smaller numbers, um, unlike what you're going to do in phase three. And um, in phase two trials, um, you also do dose ranging. So before anything gets to a pivotal trial, you want to make sure that you understand um, um, sort of dose selection um, to um, optimize the benefit to the patient and minimize the risks uh, to the patient. Um, so even though these are listed as phase one, two, and three, within each phase there are multiple trials that have to be done looking at, at different um, components that you need to get to um, phase three. And then phase three are the large pivotal trials to establish efficacy and safety of an investigational product. Um, generally, there's at least two adequate and well-controlled trials. Um, I'll talk about some exceptions to that in a second. Um, and we, um, uh, uh, the FDA, uh, provide input um, when companies are developing these trials. So we communicate with companies throughout the drug, drug life cycle. When they finish phase two trial is a critical point where we meet with the company, talk about their plans for phase three um, to make sure they're designing their trials in a way that are going to give useful information um, to support a, a licensing application. And these are things like looking at the population that they're going to study, uh, primary and second, secondary endpoints, are they appropriate, um, uh, randomization and blinding, duration of treatment relative to the proposed indication, statistical analysis plan. So um, I'll talk about a lot of this uh, next time in, in much more detail. Um, so any time that a product is going to be studied in humans um, with uh, some exceptions, there has to be um, an investigational new drug application. So you have to do these studies under an IND. Um, many investigators and companies come in for what we call a pre-IND meeting. Um, they're planning on going first in human, and it's a meeting where we will answer any questions that the investigator or sponsor has, um, or we'll give feedback on their protocol to um, try to optimize the um, result when they come in with an IND application. So we really do want to help um, uh, investigators and sponsors do things the right way. Um, the IEDs come in, um, they come in with the statement of general investigational plan, so what is the purpose of their investigation? They have to provide us a lot of detail about the product itself, how it's manufactured, how quality control is done. Um, the non-clinical information, we have to be pretty comfortable that there's sufficient data in the preclinical animal model phase to support um, safely going into human studies. 
clinical protocol uh, that we evaluate uh, very carefully, particularly for safety. Um, and then an investigator's brochure, which helps the investigators at the various sites understand the drug and potential safety problems. So when an IND is submitted, there's a 30-day clock. So um, uh, we um, have 30 days to review an IND application. Um, and at the end of that 30 days, we either need to determine that it's safe to proceed, that that investigation is safe to go forward, or that it's not safe and we put it on clinical hold. Um, so within 30 days, we let the sponsor know. If we don't respond to them within 30 days, then they can start recruiting on, onto the, um, uh, on, 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 under the IND. And the primary goal for why we review these is really to assess safety, making sure that there's sufficient non-clinical support for the study, support for the dose that they're proposing to use. Um, they have clear discontinuation rules. So um, if a patient has a particularly significant adverse event that um, they're, they're, they're stopped from participating in the study. Um, stopping rules for the study as a whole. So if they're observing um, consistent or particularly severe safety problems, if there's a halt in enrollment and um, a very careful look at the data to determine whether it's safe to proceed. And then um, a data safety monitoring board, how is it composed, when are they going to meet, are they going to do futility analysis so that you don't continue, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then throughout the life phase of, of product development, um, there are meetings between um, the FDA and investigators or, or um, industry sponsors. Uh, a quick note um, on pediatric studies. So um, there's something called the Pediatric Research Equity Act. Um, so um, for, well, for uh, a, a long time, um, uh, drug studies were not done on, on children uh, for reasons that are understandable. Um, but as a result, um, there's no labeling to help guide physicians for how to treat children with many of these drugs. Um, and um, as a result, Congress passed the Pediatric Research Equity Act in 2003, and it gives the FDA the authority to require pediatric studies in certain drugs and biological products. So all applications for new active ingredients um, or new indications for a drug, new dosage forms, um, new dosing regimens, new routes of administration um, are required to contain an assessment of safety and effectiveness in pediatric patients, unless the FDA waives that, defers it, or determines it's not applicable. So if they're coming in to um, study a drug product and develop it for marketing, they have to have a plan for pediatric development that we review. Um, we can waive that requirement. For example, if it's a disease that doesn't impact um, children, um, it can be waived. It can be deferred, so if it's a new uh, product and we don't know whether it's going to be efficacious, um, we may defer those pediatric tri uh, trials until we have some demonstration that it, it has the uh, prospect of being beneficial to children. Um, and they're required within 60 days of completing their phase two um, uh, program to submit an initial pediatric study plan. So how are they going to study this in, in children? Um, they have to use appropriate formulation, so they may have to develop new formulations of their products that are appropriate for children. And the goal really is to obtain pediatric labeling. So this has really been a game changer um, for the development of, of pediatric products, that every new product we consider um, um, how this is going to be developed for children, and if not, why not? Um, so there's also the Best Pharmaceuticals Act, or, uh, I'm sorry, Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act, uh, approved in 2002. Uh, this is more of a carrot than a stick, and this is um, we can uh, provide written requests to sponsors uh, for areas where products should be developed for children and uh, provide an incentive of market exclusivity, um, which is a, 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 a tremendous uh, benefit to the company. So. Um, they absolutely have to comply with PREA. Um, the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act is an opportunity for us to request companies voluntarily um, uh, uh, study certain products in children. And the regulations around studying uh, products in children um, are listed here. So if you involve children in research, it has to present only minimal risk 
Um, so things like blood draws um, are minimal risk. Um, minor increase over minimal risk can be um, acceptable. So things like a skin biopsy um, may be acceptable in some circumstances. If it's more than a minor um, increase over minimal risk, um, so some of the drug trials, um, there has to be a prospect of direct benefit. Um, and then there are exceptional circumstances where there's another route. But in all cases, there has to be permission and assent um, uh, provided. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go over this other than to say there are investigations that are exempt. So if it's a lawfully um, marketed drug, it's being studied not to change labeling or to add a new indication or that, um, it may be um, exempt from IND requirements. And there's a guidance um, uh, listed here um, that has all of those requirements. So, so that's INDs, how they're reviewed. Um, um, pediatric aspects. And then if a company does these studies and um, in their phase three, they demonstrate that their drug is safe and effective, um, they come in for a new drug application uh, or biologic licensing agreement if it's a monoclonal antibody or other biologic. Um, and in those cases, we look um, very carefully. So the review clock for these reviews is 10 months, sometimes up to 12 months for accelerated approvals um, in six to eight months. Um, and um, the content, they have to submit all of their clinical study reports. We get all of their raw safety and efficacy data. Uh, we want to see their proposed labeling, which we spend a lot of time sorting through, uh, whether it's accurate and reflective of their study results. We look at their product purity, potency, how they're going to manufacture. Uh, we may inspect the or we would definitely inspect the manufacturing sites. Uh, we may inspect um, investigation sites. So if it's a multi-site investigation, um, we may do um, uh, uh, site visits to look at the records from the clinical trials to ensure things were done. And this is both in the U.S. as well as uh, for international studies. Um, so the process for approving a new drug application is really quite extensive. Um, again, looking at the raw data, not just what the company presents, but actually going in and manipulating the data and making sure that any hidden safety signals are identified, that efficacy really is as purported uh, by the company. Um, so how do you define effectiveness? I, I sort of told you already that in 1962, this amendment to the FDNC Act, described um, um, adequate and well-controlled investigations, which is generally interpreted as at least two investigation. Each on its own is convincing, and these aren't necessarily replicate studies. Um, they may be um, two uh, different designs, but they both come to the same conclusion um, that uh, the product is effective and effective for the indication being proposed and in the population being proposed. Um, the quality of evidence in this I'll go through next week, but trial design, do they have appropriate controls, appropriate randomization and blinding? Are the trial endpoints clinically meaningful, which is generally viewed as um, affecting how someone feels, functions, or survives? Um, statistical considerations, they have to pre-specify how they're going to analyze the data. Um, they cannot unblind data, look at it, and then try to look in different ways to find a positive result. So they have to say upfront how they're going to do it. And they have to control for multiplicity. So if you look at the data, multiple endpoints, um, statistically, you're going to find positive results. And they need to have a plan for um, how they're going to handle um, multiplicity in their study. Um, there are examples of where a single adequate and well-controlled trial plus confirmatory evidence may be sufficient. Um, and I, I won't go into details of that. And there may be circumstances like when a disease is life-threatening or severely debilitating, it's a rare disease, or you can't conduct a human, uh, a proper human trial um, uh, or the animal rule. So um, there's a product approved, ciprofloxacin was approved for, um, uh, uh, for plague, and you can't study that in humans, although there were 
anecdotal cases of patients infected that were treated with ciprofloxacin, but they had animal data and that was viewed as efficient for approval for that particular indication. Safety assessment, we look at the frequency of, of adverse events compared uh, drug compared, compared to placebo. Um, looking at treatment emergent adverse events, so only those adverse events that happen after the first dose is administered. Um, serious adverse events, patients who discontinue um, participation due to adverse events, is there an imbalance between the treatment, which would be um, concerning in placebo, um, are there deaths? And again, you're looking at um, differences between the treatment arm and placebo arm. Um, and we look uh, very meticulously at that um, safety data in various um, ways, looking for signals um, uh, um, uh, that may be problematic for, uh, for marketing a product. Um, not all products um, that, that come in uh, for approval, uh, or I should say very few products that come in, um, go to advisory committees, but um, advisory committees are there to um, assist the FDA by bringing in independent um, outside experts to advise us in cases where um, there may be controversy or um, the data may be, um, uh, you know, there may be borderline results where there's an argument for why something may be acceptable, but it's not clear. Um, an advisory committee will be convened, um, and there are many, many other reasons. Um, these are composed of a chair, um, several members with diverse expertise. So, you know, for our, our specialty, it may include allergists, immunologists, pulmonologists, statisticians. There's usually a consumer advocate, an industry representative. Um, and these are people who are selected with particular expertise in clinical research in that particular area. Um, they're typically open meetings, so the COVID vaccine advisory meetings have been open. Um, the Pulmonary Allergy Drug Advisory Committee, which I had been on before joining the FDA, is an, is an open meeting. Um, and the committee members get briefing packets from the FDA and the sponsor. They're posted publicly on the FDA website. Um, there are presentations by the FDA and the sponsor, public comments. Um, and then questions are developed um, by the FDA to present to the committee about whether the data being presented um, demonstrates um, adequate safety, adequate efficacy, and on the whole, does the risk-benefit um, considerations uh, support approval of a given product? In some cases, uh, the questions may be, you know, what additional studies are needed to support this product if there are um, if there's areas of uncertainty. Um, and, and then the committee has advised the FDA, but the FDA makes the final decision. So, you know, many cases it's a unanimous vote. Uh, many cases there are split votes. Um, and the advice and the comments taken from the advisory committees is very carefully considered. All right, um, moving on to safety labeling. Um, so um, th this is from a, a, a very nice um, Rostrum that's coming out in JCI in practice uh, soon. It's in press now from uh, Camp Clarigen, our group. Um, and it describes um, different levels of safety labeling. So adverse reactions are what I described before. It's the overall adverse reaction profile comparing treatment versus placebo, um, looking for things that are more frequent in the treatment arm. Generally, there's a cutoff, you know, if it occurs in greater than 1% or greater than 5%. Um, there are warnings and precautions. These are significant adverse reactions, things that may be fatal reactions, serious reactions, or reactions that can be prevented or mitigated through appropriate use of the drug. Contraindications are uh, what, well, it's contraindication. So um, uh, uh, times when, when you wouldn't want to use the drug. And then box warning is the highest level where um, there are certain contradictions, serious warnings um, that may lead to death or serious injury, and you want to make sure that those are apparent to the prescribers. So labels, um, I, I never completely appreciated labels until uh, I actually had to help revise and write and, and, and review these. Um, and I have to say one of the smartest things to do uh, with any new product that comes out read the prescribing information. Um, there's a site, Drugs at FDA, which you can Google and get any label. Um, 
So on here, um, they have the year that the drug was approved. Um, so this particular is for Nicola, so 2015. Recent major changes, so if it's a new label, these are the reasons why it's new. Uh, indications, doses, contraindications are here, and then the warnings and precautions are here. But if you go deeper to the section here, 5.1, it'll give you more granularity about the basis for that warning and precaution. And then, so this is all summary material. Um, the labeling information, um, you know, things to highlight. So the warnings and precautions sections will go into detail about what the concerns are, what data was used to support that. Um, the use in specific populations, so um, up until 2015, um, and this was a e easy board question, were products that were category A, B, C, D, or X, um, those went away, and the new um, pregnancy and lactation labeling rule requires that more data is presented, which is um, what data do we have from animal models and human experience about potential risk in pregnancy, lactation, pediatric use, and geriatric use. Um, so it's not a simple classification, but it gives you a lot more of the information, which in a lot of cases is not sufficient, um, that there really is a, a deficiency in data in, in many of these products to help guide in, in these areas. Overdosage, so, you know, accidental overdoses, um, whatever data is available will go in here. And then I really urge looking at the clinical studies. So if you want to see why something was approved um, and the, um, um, the claims for benefits, they're all listed in here under the indication. And these are very carefully vetted by us to ensure that um, um, they reflect the actual results of the study. So there's a wealth of information within the prescribing information um, that I really encourage for medications you're going to use regularly, particularly newer, uh, newly approved, um, read through this. It really is a good use of your time. And then this is an example of a, of a box warning. Um, so new drug approvals, this just gives you an indication of how many new drugs are approved. Um, in 2020, despite all the activity around um, COVID, there are 53 novel drugs. So um, Approvals may be novel drugs, but there are also approvals for previously approved drugs, but for new indications, um, new formats for medications. Um, um, you know, there, there are all sorts of approvals, but these are for novel drugs. Um, and, and of note, of all drugs approved, 75% of new drugs, novel drugs approved worldwide are approved in the U.S. before being approved in other countries. So. Um, the um, FDA approvals really are um, sort of um, uh, dominate the approval of, of, of novel products. Uh, very quickly, and I know we're, we're, we're getting towards uh, one o'clock, post-marketing, we very carefully follow safety. Once dr uh, drugs are um, approved, um, companies uh, have to submit um, safety reports at regular intervals um, and um, we have an Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology, as well as clinical reviewers um, in our group that review all of the safety um, updates. Um, most surveillance is passive, so things that are reported through FAERS, the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System. Some of the safety events are reported to the manufacturer and then reported to us. Some are based on the literature. So is there anything new in the literature that alters the benefit risk assessment for a drug? Or we'd have to go back and reconsider, um, you know, whether there needs to be more safety information put on the label. Um, there is active surveillance, so some products are approved with um, concerns or areas of uncertainty, and in those cases, we may require a post-marketing study um, looking at safety, pediatric studies uh, to comply with the Pediatric Research Equity Act, um, and then for accelerated approvals, which may be approved on surrogate endpoints, we require they go back and they do a proper um, endpoint. Um, and, and then we have a database called Sentinel, which is a national database where we can do our own epidemiologic safety um, uh, uh, studies um, if there are particular signals identified. So. As an example, EpiPens, there were um, uh, identification of user errors 
spontaneous activation from sideway force when removing the blue cap, or the blue cap is not completely on and uh, the device is activated um, uh, prematurely. There have been difficulties removing from the carrier tube uh, user error, errors, and as a result, the labeling was updated in 2020, and there was a letter that went out to uh, healthcare providers. Um, the most recent was a, was the bo box warning placed on Singular, uh, and this came about um, safety around neuropsychiatric events were first reported in 2007. In 2008, um, there were additional post-marketing reports, including things like behavior changes, completed um, suicides. So warnings and precautions were put on drug safety communication to your healthcare provider letters were sent out. Additional reports, 2008 through 2019, additional discussions around um, whether additional information needed to go on the label and whether um, uh, these were concerning signals. Um, but due to um, stakeholder requests for a, more, a, a closer look at safety concerns, there's an advisory committee convened between the pediatric and drug safety and risk mitigation advisory committees. Um, the agency reviewed FAERS data, published literature. We did our observational study using that Sentinel database. And although there was no clear association, um, sort of looking at risk benefit and how Singular was being used and concerns about potential association with these events, um, a box warning was put on Singular uh, in, in March of 2020. It really is the highlight that for allergic rhinitis, for example, um, it, it really shouldn't be used as a personal line therapy. Um, it's to make uh, prescribers aware of potential concerns around neuropsychiatric events. Um, and then um, the, the rest of this, so the COVID stuff, I, I don't think, um, since it's 1257, um, I, I may um, delay that to next month and very quickly go over that. So um, I may end here um, and answer any questions that you have. And I hope this was um, useful. I know there are a lot of details, um, but, but, but I do think it's important to understand how drugs are handled, how safety is monitored. And, and again, um, I can't emphasize enough um, how important it is to look at prescribing information. When you have questions about drugs, um, there really is good information in there. So um, let me end there, um, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Kelly, this is Chris Miller, one of the clinical faculty members. Um, I got a few quick questions. Some of this may be addressed in the follow-up talk. Um, is, does FDA look at any the drug degradation, whether it's naturally or accelerated by, you know, like mail order, 120 degree mailbox type situations? Uh, uh, yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Chris. I was just um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit lost with. Um, I, I'm just going to stop presenting so that I can see the screen. Um, could you just repeat that real quickly? I know it had to do with drug degradation. Yeah, I was just wondering if the FDA looked at that in any fashion. I, I think of the mail order day and the 120 degree Fahrenheit mailbox and my medicine sitting out there for a day and a half. So, so, so the answer is yes. And you would be um, surprised at the level of detail that these things are looked at. Um, but all of those things are watched very carefully, um, sort of looking at every possible scenario making sure that the drug product is stable and, and maintains potency even in those sorts of environments. So, um, so the answer is yes. I would defer to my chemistry colleagues um, in another division who do that. Um, but absolutely, all of those um, are, are considerations in, in monitoring uh, uh, products and approving products. Okay. And then along the same lines too, how do they come up with the expiration dates on the medications? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are, 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 are good questions. Um, so it, it, it has, I mean, it, it has to do with stability. Um, they, they have to do stability tests that demonstrate um, loss of, uh, of activity over, over time. Um, I can probably um, get a better answer for you that I can either email or I can bring this up uh, next month when I talk. Um, I, I'd, I'd have to um, consult with, with one of our um, manufacturing uh, folks okay. um, in terms of the details of how they do that. Yeah, maybe next month if that opportunity presents, that'd be great. And then it's my last question. question. 
and I'll be done is um, as we look at dr in the world of polypharmacy, as I'm getting older and I see all the medications yeah. coming my way, um, looking at drug drug interactions, and I, I know this is difficult because everybody's going to be on a different group of meds. And I'm not so worried about the whole drug, but I'm more worried about metabolite interactions. And is there anything that any easy way or a way to look at that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm with you, uh, by the way, uh, in terms of in terms of age. So um, so these things are looked at very carefully in broad categories. Um, I, I'd have to talk to our clinical farm um or a clinical pharmacologist to get a better sense for um, in what detail they do this. And I can bring this back next uh, next month, Chris. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll jot down both of these questions. So there are things that are anticipated, but, um, you know, I, I, I'd have to talk to them about the details. I understand. Okay. I, I, I thank you for that. And this has been a very informative talk. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, hush up now and let the others get to it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh -huh. Hey, Kelly, thanks for the great talk. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I have one quick question. I was kind of curious about with, with the COVID vaccines and they all have these emergency approvals. Um, does the FDA take those emergency approvals away, um, um, you know, like after people get vaccinated or how does all that work? Yeah, so I didn't get to my, um, I, I didn't get to my slide. Um, but, 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 but the answer is yes. Um, so the emergency use authorizations are um, only used in emergencies. So the emergency was declared in March of 2020 by the Secretary of Department of Health and Human Services. And what it does is it allows unapproved products to be used or um, approved products, but for a new indication. Um, in situations where there's no approved and available alternative. And the criteria that we use, it's still a high bar. It had, they have to have demonstrated safety data, and there has to be efficacy data that meets the bar, bar maybe a benefit, which is not as high as for a licensing agreement, but it's still pretty high. And yes, these are rescinded. So if new data comes out that says, actually, it's not that beneficial. So hydroxychloroquine, came in under the EUA, and that was rescinded when the studies clearly demonstrated that there wasn't benefit to that. So um, these are um, um, sort of the EUAs are constantly monitored. They're not intended to be long-term. They're really intended to make it available until the companies come in with their actual applications and, and we can approve the products. And, and right now there are nine products uh, or eight products under EUA. Um, convalescent plasma, bercitinib, um, the monoclonal antibodies, um, and then there's some critical care um, sedation medications and replacement uh, fluids for, for the ICU that are, are under EUA. Um, but yeah, they, so that was a long answer to your question. They can be rescinded, and if new data comes out, and this is true of approved drugs as well, that um, we're constantly looking at the risk-benefit ratio and reassessing whether there's new signal that justifies a regulatory action. Okay. Well, thanks again. Um, I, we really appreciate you taking the time oh, to do no. this. Morning. And um, we look forward to uh, meeting with you again next month. Yeah, so, I, I, I really do hope this was helpful um, uh, uh, for the fellows in particular. Um, and if any other questions come up, I'm, I'm happy to answer them next month or I'm happy to answer them by uh, email if, if anything comes up. But next month will be more um, design of trials and populations and endpoints, things like that. So thank you again, Paul, and thank you all for your attention. Um, this has actually been kind of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. Not kind of fun. <laughs> Have a great weekend, Kelly. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.